Hello everyone, welcome back. I hope you have uh, enjoyed and uh, you are enjoying the proceeding so far. There are so many exciting things to come. We are fortunate to have a pioneer industry professional, Mr. Alessandro Sosedo, speaking about the industrial machine learning pipeline with Python and Avro. Um, he is an industry uh, technologies leader with over 10 years of experience on software development. He is currently the chef scientist at the um, Institute of Ethical AI and Machine Learning on UK-based research centre. He has a strong record on building multiple departments on machine learning engineer from scratch and leading the delivery of large-scale machine learning systems across financial, uh, insurance, legal, transport, manufacturing and construction centers. Please join me with a big hand to welcome Mr. Alejandro Sosedo. Awesome, cool stuff. So just uh, to be conscious of time, uh, I mean, if it's possible to just get a heads up, um, we're gonna be running until 45 past. Um, that is the time I assume it will finish. But. Thank you very much. I'm really excited um, to go through this presentation today. Um, it's a very interesting topic, very relevant to what's going on. Um, I don't think I need to uh, follow up any of, of that introduction. I really, really appreciate it. And you know, I do want to give a massive thanks to the organizers for you know, putting together this, this awesome event and for, for all the attendees for, for joining in. Um, I will be covering a few key points from a high level. Um, you know, my background is mainly in this space of, of machine learning, applied machine learning. Um, but right now, as was mentioned, I'm running this research center based in the UK called the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning. Um, and basically what this uh, um, research center focuses on is uh, on developing frameworks for responsible machine learning uh, by putting together these highly technical uh, individuals with uh, cross-functional set of teams from humanities uh, and social science backgrounds. Um, some of the uh, work that uh, we focus on, uh, it addresses a lot of the complexities um, that are available with the new rise of machine learning. Um, this is the intersection between data science, software engineering, and DevOps. And it has introduced a lot of uh, unknowns when it comes to deploying these systems because it requires best practices from all. And sometimes you have data scientists, um, you know, trying to write like production ready code or software engineers that are using accuracy as their ultimate means um, to measure uh, performance, where it's important to take best practice from all sides. And to add more complexity to this, there is that intersection between that point that was just mentioned of the machine learning expertise, that is those intersections, together with industry domain and policy expertise. We try to focus on that middle piece of uh, coming out with best practices that can raise the bar for quality, safety, and performance um, when uh, doing the use of these technologies. Uh, we put together a set of core principles for practitioners, for machine learning engineers to adapt. These are eight that range from uh, human uh, in the loop designs, to bias evaluation, explainability, reproducibility, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also released this week a procurement framework for uh, key industry practitioners that are looking to procure uh, AI systems. Um, so this is basically a practical checklist. Um, so if you're interested to, to uh, get involved, uh, check it out at ethical.institute. Um, we're always keen to receive new members. I just realized that the slides are about 10 seconds delayed, but We'll cope with that. Today I'm going to be covering an uh, overview um, of uh, uh, industrial machine learning. We're going to build a machine learning pipeline. Um, basically it's going to be an LSTM uh, for predicting prices. Uh, we're going to be uh, then building our system so that it's horizontally scalable. And then we're going to make it industry ready uh, using Airflow uh, to manage the uh, data pipelines. And of course we're going to be learning by example. What better way than building a tech startup today from scratch? And you know, what better um, area than uh, you know, jumping on the hype train and going through the cryptocurrency 
uh, former cryptocurrency craze. So I want to set the grounds. Imagine we are uh, in early 2017 before cryptocurrency exploded and we are a team that basically wanted to put together this startup and we want to ask the question of can we survive the craze, the crypto craze of 2017. The data set is going to be all historical data from the top 100 cryptocurrencies. Uh, data goes from the back to the beginning um, to uh, September, uh, it's actually September uh, 2017 and it's over 500,000 daily prices. Um, just to emphasize, this will be pretty obvious, but this is not investment advice. This is more focused on the machine learning advice. This is just an example um, for the laws. And uh, we're going to be using this interface, um, which allows us to get access to the cryptocurrency prices, um, as well as this interface that allows us to uh, run the computations. Uh, you can find the code and the slides uh, in this uh, links. Um, so I'll just uh, pause there. And um, yeah, let's uh, do this. Let's jump into it. So June 2017, uh, CryptoML built an incredibly accurate model. It was predicting with insane accuracy um, the, the price of, of, of cryptocurrencies, made a lot of people millionaires because they were putting their heart and soul and their houses, uh, mortgages on this algorithm, which resulted in them raising 100 million of VC money. So now they uh, had to figure out, they had to figure out what uh, they needed to do to actually convert this into proper uh, machine learning. Uh, they found the perfect data set, but they didn't know what exactly to do. So they just uh, started copy pasting code from Stack Overflow as, as you do. And they realized that that wasn't enough. They had to actually do it properly. And they found that the best way to do it is by building this concept of machine learning pipeline. The machine learning pipeline uh, abstracted and generalized in two different workflows. Uh, the, the development of the, of the machine learning model and um, the iterations until it's ready and you have an accuracy that um, is, is suitable. And then once you're ready, you persist that model with the code and you put it in production so that you can see the um, new, new data and provide predictions. Um, in regards to the first part, the machine learning development, it includes the data to convert uh, uh, well, first cleaning the data, assessing um, um, the, the, the potential biases within it, uh, class, uh, class imbalances, uh, then uh, abstracting some features, um, um, choosing some models, accuracy uh, um, functions, and then uh, iterating until you're happy. And then again, as, uh, as mentioned, it is the second step um, to uh, predict for unseen, unseen results. Um, the crypto ML team learned the hard way that just you know stacking more layers doesn't equal better performance, and actually following best practices does result in better res uh, in better results. And this is you know analyzing your data representability, building a test data set that tells you with you know a reasonable um, uh, a, a reasonable way like how uh, you're going to perform in production, even though it's never uh, possible to have the exact, you want to get as close as possible. You want to focus on feature engineering uh, an analysis of, of the feature importance, uh, how the, the features affect the inference results, and how you can uh, make use or um, um, of, of some of this domain knowledge into the features themselves. How can you remove some correlations, etc. Um, understanding which models are the most suitable for which uh, specific use case, and you know, overall taking a very pragmatic approach. Um, and once the, the, the crypto ML team went through a few iterations, they felt ready to build their deep learning pipeline. So let's get started you know, putting together our LSTM uh, training model. Uh, this is again on the first workflow, we're going to be generating our, our model. Uh, the next step will be to use that model in production for inference of unseen data points. So uh, I assume that there were quite a few other machine learning talks, so I'm not gonna go into super, uh, into too much detail. But basically what we're doing here is we're training a, a recurrent neural network, more specifically an LSTM. Uh, this LSTM, what it's, do what it's doing is it, it's taking 50 uh, prices and it's trying to predict based on this 50 prices, what is going to be that next price. The way that we train it, is by taking, um, say for example, all of, the, all of the data points and then creating 
a window, a sliding window of size 50, and then using that as our train uh, test data, test being the next one uh, in the line. So what we're going to be doing in this function, first we're going to clean and transform the data itself. Uh, here we have this function that basically creates uh, the windows uh, in our X, and then the following um, uh, input, uh, the following uh, data point as the target. Then we're going to be selecting or creating our model. This is our LSTM, our RNN. We're going to be fitting this, uh, this data uh, to train the, the model. Uh, it's using Keras and, and TensorFlow. And uh, then we save the model. We persist it um, into this basically export, which is saving in, in the local folder. Um, then what we want to do is we want to make use of this uh, model that we just created. Uh, we want to take the 50 prices that we uh, want to use. Uh, we want to make sure that they are suitable for the uh, model to be able to process. So we transform the data using the same function. We then load the model from the, the file that we just exported. We basically load it from the folder. And then we uh, run a prediction. So this is basically trying to get an inference with this unseen data set so that we can try to guess what is going to be the next price um, and the CryptoML team was like, oh, it works. It's actually giving us uh, our prediction. We take some, some of the Bitcoin prices. Um, we train a model, which, as you remember, saves uh, as an output the train model. And then we get a prediction. Cool. So now they're ready to become millionaires. Uh, so they, they were like, oh, production. OK, fine. We can sort that out. So we'll just get our good old Crontab, because it's never failed anyone in production we're just gonna put put it out there make sure that you know all of our all of our jobs are, are are scheduled and it's all gonna be fine and then they realized uh in the in the next stage that you know they needed to to um take the next next step uh let's now picture september 2017 we're getting close closer to when you know the cryptocurrency was at its peak uh, the the crypto ml team was caught using deep learning was caught using this amazing lstms so they were featured in TechCrunch and all of the global news. Uh, you know, they were giving talks at all the PyCon conferences. You know, they, they, their user base, user base exploded. And um, they, they started to get a lot of requests that just couldn't be handled in this uh, cron, CronTab complete mess. So it was time to go distributed. And this is when we introduced Celery. Uh, Celery is, uh, in summary, distributed asynchronous task queue for Python. Uh, and also a uh, vegetable. And uh, we're going to be using it to create a producer-consumer architecture. It basically uses RabbitMQ, um, and it has, it has the ability for you to create multiple, uh, in summary, multiple workers that are able to perform a specific task that are just continuously listening, and producers that basically say, hey, I need this task to be done, and I need this type of worker. Right, so um, you know the CryptoML teams thought that actually going distributed was going to be very hard, but they realized that it wasn't. What we're going to do now is, if you remember our function, the deep, deep predict function that we used, what we're going to be doing is we're going to celerize it. So in order to do that, we're going to do the following: we're going to make sure that we initialize uh, Celery with the ID and point it into the right uh, um, RabbitMQ location. We're going to convert the function and tell it that this is a Celery worker. We're going to make sure that all of the inputs and, and returns are serialized, right? Because this is going to be transferred across um, uh, into the into the, the the RabbitMQ, so it needs to be serializable. It's going to be transferred. Um, so everything that we get in our in our parameter, we should assume that it's actually um, going to be serialized. Uh, load is just basically a, um, a pickle uh, load, and dump is a pickle dump. Uh, and then we, again, run our, our, our uh, prediction. And then our result, we just uh, dump it and return it. And in order to run it, we just basically uh, point into that file and run it just saying, Celery, run that worker. And what it basically does, it just creates this worker that is listening in that machine. Um, Normally, it really uh, it runs it with the number uh, a number of workers that are uh, relevant to the number of cores that machine has. So if you have eight cores, it would run eight workers that would just be connecting to that queue, and it would be just listening. Um, 
Now, we're already halfway there. We have one worker or maybe a couple workers already listening to that queue, and they're basically saying, I'm ready. Just send me that um, data set and I'll start processing it. Um, so now what we have to do is create the producer. And the producer, uh, if it wasn't sellerized, what we would do is we would just get some prices, we would run them to get a prediction, and then we just print it, right? So that, that's the usual thing that, you know, well, not the usual thing, but this is something that you know you could do, right? You're, you're just trying to run a prediction from a set of prices. But what we're going to do now is, how, uh, is show you how it would be run um, with a sellerized function. With a sellerized function, the only thing that needs to be done is to make sure that it's explicitly, uh, uh, um, that it's explicitly called by saying that it's, it's a sellerized function and that all of the inputs and outputs are serialized. So again, instead of just passing the prices, we serialize the inputs with the dump. We then call the function using dot delay as opposed to just calling it. And then we just wait for the task to finish because remember that it's actually being distributed. Normally, you don't wait for it to finish because you would want to just run it so that it processes something and puts it in a database. Um, you know, you normally, this, this would probably remove uh, the uh, efforts of, of having it um, um, distributed because you're now waiting for it to finish. But, you know, in this case, we just want to wait to make it uh, easier to show. Once we get the result, we deserialize it and then we just print it. And when we run the producer, uh, it just basically adds that task to the queue. The workers that are listening pick it up, run it, and then if relevant, it puts back the, the output um, into the queue, whatever the return statement is. Um, we can use Flower uh, to visualize the tasks. So Flower is basically a package that doesn't come with Celery, but you can just install it very easily. And it allows you to see uh, what the state of all of, our, all of your jobs are. Um, normally when you are working with Celery in production or in development, it's useful to use it given that it um, often you have to debug what the state of your tasks is at, at, at a certain point. So this allows you to basically just observe whether you have some tasks that have been running for too long or some tasks that may, may have failed. Um, and yeah, I mean, as, as, as you scale your computation, it's very easy to just run more workers, uh, mainly because it just has one point to connect to. You just say, uh, run 10 more workers across 10 different machines. As long as they can connect to the RabbitMQ, um, it's going to run completely fine. So I think it's very easy to scale something, and the good thing is that it's written purely in Python. And yeah, so distributed win. Uh, we're, uh, the CryptoML guys were feeling quite confident. Uh, they managed to handle much heavier loads, and they were like, you know, we're sorted. But then December 2017 came in, and you know, about to, to have Santa arriving with the final gift of, of cryptocurrency going to the roof. And the crypto ML uh, had now an exponentially increasing amount of internal and external use cases. They weren't only using this deep predict function, um, but they were using uh, many other sort of uh, you know, approaches to, to come up with crazy bars and, and predictions of how cryptocurrency is gonna behave as if it actually worked. But um, yeah, they, they, they basically just had a lot of stuff to run. And they also realized that machine learning is actually just the tip of the iceberg, especially referring to the machine learning algorithm itself. Um, the thing that surrounds machine learning is when it introduces a large complexity, and this is what we normally refer to as machine learning operations. And I actually forgot to put the slide, but uh, on GitHub we have a uh, list that outlines all, of, not all, but outlines a large set of machine learning operation libraries. These are libraries that allow you to um, build production machine learning uh, with a bit more support. Uh, this covers uh, machine learning versioning libraries, uh, machine learning orchestration libraries in production, uh, monitoring libraries for, for your models, etc., etc. So if you want to check it out, it's on github.com slash ethicalml. And um, you probably will find it in the same uh, repo as this one. 
And um, yeah, they started to see that their data flow complexity was increasing really, really fast. So this meant that there was a growing need to pull data from different locations. Uh, there was a growing need to pre-process and post-process uh, data sets. Um, there was a lot of requirements to transform the data sets as well. Um, there was a lot of uh, task, task complexity uh, as well as uh, the dependency of the tasks one task depending on another one, if the previous one, uh, previous one failed, you want to make sure that the next one doesn't get executed. So they, had, they started to have a lot of complexity when it came to their, their, their workflows. And um, you know, some of their, 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 their flow was actually getting quite unmanageable. And just having cellarized uh, uh, tasks was, was not enough for them to be able to do it. So now is when we introduce Airflow. Uh, this is what I refer to as the Swiss Army knife of data pipelines. Airflow in brief is a data uh, pipeline uh, framework. It's written in Python. It has a very active community and it has a, a lot of functionality, uh, including a UI for management. Um, the reason why I introduced Celery was not just for fun. It's also because it runs with a Celery backend. That is um, as well something to take into consideration that it's currently an Apache incubation project, which means that um, Apache is, is uh, um, really taking it to develop it, which means that it, you know, it will gain a lot of stability and uh, like a lot of the other Apache tools, um, you know, it, it will definitely grow uh, towards the better. I've had some questions in, in previous conferences whether I thought that uh, Apache was just gonna rewrite the entire thing in Java. Um, I don't think so. Um, hopefully not, because I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, Airflow is great. Uh, but I don't think so. I mean, like, Airflow 2 is coming in, and it's on Python. Uh, there's no dodgy stuff of hidden jar files or anything, so that's, that's all good. Um, and the core of Airflow, it consists of directed uh, acyclic graphs uh, that they refer to as DAGs. These are basically computational graphs that state uh, the connection and the dependencies of all of the tasks that you have. Um, this is from a, an ETL perspective, um, how each of these specific um, uh, tasks are able to perform so, some specific transformation. Um, it is important to also mention that uh, Airflow is not to be confused um, to some data streaming uh, uh, um, products or, or libraries or frameworks. And, and the reason why I mentioned this, as well as the, mission, the, the, the reason why people mention this in their website, is because um, Airflow is not designed to transfer data across the um, operators themselves. It's meant to just transfer things like IDs or smaller um, uh, sized uh, data. And, and, and it's also not for high performance uh, requirements. Uh, at least Airflow 1.x is quite slow and it takes a lot of time specifically from going from one task to the other, not as much to just execute one. This is something that hopefully will be fixed on Airflow uh, 2.0. But one of the things that it is emphasized is that Airflow's core focus is more on that ETL batch processing side as opposed to the um, you know, real-time uh, stream that other solutions like Kafka, for example, would have. And um, yeah, operators uh, are each of the steps, and um, each of the steps are uh, modular which means that they are uh, um, uh, quite uh, separate from uh, the Airflow code. So you can define your, your code uh, as Python and then call it from your uh, Airflow operators. This is one of the main benefits of Airflow. It's modularity that allows for, for that separation. And then uh, for the crypto ML team, the use case that they wanted to do is they wanted to pull um, um, the, the crypto data every day uh, data that is uh, then transformed and standardized. Then once it's ready, a prediction should be computed and then the prediction should be stored in the database and if relevant, a trade should be uh, executed. So that's, that's something that we're gonna try to break down into Airflow terminology. And what we're gonna aim to do is we're gonna build this first DAG, which will consist of an operator uh, that will basically load the data, the, a specific cryptocurrency data from the database, will transform it, then it will send it 
for a prediction. It will then wait until the prediction is finished. It will then branch and then call a uh, operation so that it stores the, the, the results and it also executes a trade uh, where relevant. Uh, each of these operators, we're going to dive into a bit more detail. Um, they are all operators, even though they have different names. And um, the way that they um, are normally referred to is operator is one that just uh, runs a specific execution. A sensor is one that waits until a condition is true. And a, a branch is a conditional, uh, as the name implies, a branch. Uh, and then finally, the, the operators at the end. So let's, let's get started by first creating our DAG. Um, we're going to first uh, define the DAG uh, with the name of Crypto Predict. This is going to be our first DAG. We're going to tell it that the start date should be uh, ASAP. This should actually be a little bit in the past. And then schedule interval, interval will be none because we want it to be executed straight away. Um, we would then define our operators, which I'm going to cover in a bit. And then we would define the order in which the operators are executed. So we have the operators of transform, run, wait, store, send. And then the order is first transform, then run, then wait. And then from wait, run, store, and then also run, send. Um, once you define your, your DAG, you can visualize it in, in the Airflow uh, main screen, where you can actually also see all of your other DAGs that are, have been executed, all of the jobs that have failed, that have succeeded, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's actually a really good way to visualize it. You also have a way to see a detailed view. So here you can see the task dependency, as well as all of the runs across all of the times where it has been executed. You can see all of the types of operators. And this slide specifically may be a little bit complex. Uh, we can see ours, which is significantly more boring. Um, it just has a Python operator and the crypto sensor. You can also see it as a graph view from the front end, where we can see here that you know we're, we're running, uh, we're, we're pulling and we're, we're transforming the data, we're running it, we're then waiting until the prediction is done, and then we're just running the, the two other um, specific pieces. And Airflow provides you with several out-of-the-box operators. So this could be operator to run a specific SQL query, an operator to um, download an S3 file, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and another thing that we need to cover before jumping into building our operators is how you pass data downstream. Uh, in order to pass data from one job to another, you use this thing called XCOM. Um, I don't know why they call it that, but it's just called XCOM. And um, yeah, I mentioned that Airflow is not data streaming. What you pass with XCOM, XCOM is normally just variables like the ID of the object that is stored in the database. It's also worth mentioning that the XCOM objects, every time it's passed to the next uh, DAG, it's actually stored in the Postgres database. It's pickled and stored in the Postgres database. So you have an expensive operation every time that you pass some XCOM objects. Um, so now let's start defining our simple operators, uh, starting with the transform operator. In this case, we're going to be using the Python operator. This basically just is a wrapper that takes a Python function. The function is just going to be something that pulls data or transforms it, um, taking like the specific ID from, from, from the um, parameters and then loading it from the database and then returning the ID. The way that we define it, we give it a specific name that should be unique. Uh, we say that context should be given, which means that parameters can be passed uh, downstream, such as the, the DAG ID or the XCOM objects. That's what um, the, the context provides. Um, the Python callable is just basically saying, run that function, so nothing too crazy. And XCOM pushed true is just basically saying, like, push whatever you send to the next DAG operator that is dependent. And we just say, which DAG does it belong to? Right, the second... Uh, Operator will also be a Python operator, so it's going to be very similar. We're going to have a Python function that is going to process something. And remember, because we're passing XCOM objects, um, all of the subsequent operators will be able to get the task of the previous one. Um, now, in terms of the next one, it was the sensor. And the sensor is the one that actually waits um, until it's done. And what it's basically going to be doing is it's going to wait until um, the specific condition returns true. Uh, we can visualize our operators in detail. 
and uh, we can also visualize our downstream parameters, which is quite useful. Um, the last one is basically creating uh, another separate DAG that basically will just trigger all of the batch jobs. Um, what this will basically be is just a set of operators that pull for new data, uh, store all of the cryptocurrencies, and then just trigger the processing sub DAGs. Uh, as I mentioned, Airflow is still quite uh, high, it's, it's still quite in its early stages until the second version. So in order for you to trigger any dynamic DAGs, it has to be through the Airflow API. Um, so yeah, with that said, um, I, you, you should definitely check out um, <laughs> Airflow. Uh, read the documentation. I do recommend it, especially with Airflow 1.0. Uh, check out the alternatives. Um, for Python, I would say it is the preferred one, but your use case may require other. There are special mentions to other technologies. And, uh, you know, for CryptoML, it, it didn't work out, as you know. Um, but, yeah, so with that said, today we covered an overview uh, of machine learning pipelines. We made our system scalable with Celery, and then we built industrial pipelines using Airflow. Uh, you can find the slides at uh, my GitHub, uh, which will be um, also redirected to the uh, Institute's GitHub. And with that said, uh, thank you very much. I think I'm out of time, but we can catch up for questions at the pub later today. Thank you very much. Hello, any questions? My question is about the resource planning in Airflow and how does it make, you, make sure that even your worker could have multi-thread situation. Uh, the summation of the worker still live within the limitation of the system. Can you talk about some of those? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Just, just to uh, ask the organizers, do we have time for a few questions? Yes. Awesome. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, the, way that Airflow schedules jobs is using the scheduler. So the way that you actually run it, you uh, have to explicitly run that specific scheduler. It runs an instance of Celery, and um, Celery is the one that handles uh, all of the orchestration. Um, the ability and flexibility that Celery gives you is that you can define um, into more detail the uh, re requirements that specific types of tasks may require. Um, but from, from my awareness or, or what we've uh, encountered is that it has to be quite explicitly and you have to develop your own way of making it happen for you to be able to say this task requires a uh, minimum amount of memory. So it, it, is, it is quite manual uh, to be able to do that. I think with Airflow 2.0, um, or with other backends, which you can use with, with Kubernetes, which I haven't really tried, um, I would assume that there will be more flexibility. But uh, I think one thing to, to emphasize is the scheduler does uh, have a lot of bugs. You have to reset it every once in a while. And, you know, even though it has a lot of um, caveats, for some reason, you know, it's still something that, you know, Airflow is probably one of the most... Um, useful uh, ETL uh, pipelines that, that I've interacted with, even though it has a lot of caveats, but. Mm -hmm. So when you build out the pipeline, uh, how do you check if all the objects or all the steps are there? Is there some kind of validation procedure that you can check that, you know, everything that's supposed to flow through the pipeline has been defined or not? Um, so, do you have a specific uh, example? I mean, so, uh, just to give context, uh, the way that it's normally defined, um, you know, it, it was just by um, first creating all of the operators, and once you have the operators created, um, you have to make that definition. Now, when, when you register the operators under a specific DAG, um, those get registered as a top-level operator that gets executed as a first step all in parallel. So the best way to be able to do
do that is by looking at the graph. But do you have a specific example? Because normally um, you wouldn't really have a job that is not scheduled at the right place unless you screwed up. But do you have a specific example? No, like, like if multiple people are defining the DAGs, right? And how do you make sure that, you know, if you are calling someone else's DAG later down the line, that's been defined and it's there. I mean, just before you run the jobs, just like a code run through to make sure these things are in place. I see, I see, I see, I see what you mean. Oh, interesting, interesting question. Um, so the, the, the way that Airflow uh, currently operates um, is by making sure that it loads all the uh, DAGs into memory. So if you want to create a new one, you would have to load it into memory. Um, if, if that DAG is deleted for some reason, um, you would get a specific error. And when looking at the logs, you would be able to see that uh, that specific DAG uh, you know, probably didn't exist. Whether you would get an exception that tells you DAG doesn't exist, I'm not 100% sure. But one of the core benefits about Airflow is that you can see and visualize uh, air, uh, Airflow errors as well as the logs um, and uh, the, the errors within the logs. But not before the deployment, actually. Um, yeah, I think, I think if, it's, if it's running and you load a DAG that references another one, um, it would actually error out because all the DAGs are uh, defined in a static manner. So, so yes. H however, um, it does get a little bit more complex because at the end you saw how I ran a dynamic set of, yeah. uh, of DAGs using that uh, session. Uh, yeah, when you use the session, you would just get an error because it's dynamic. Right. These are not sub DAGs. Yeah. Sub DAGs are defined st uh, actually statically, so you would actually get that static compilation. Okay. Uh, Airflow doesn't have the ability to define dynamic uh, number of uh, DAGs that are not defined on start. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, thank you, Mr. Alejandro, for the inspirational and very inspiring and informative speech.